Hi, we're now in Psychology 1, doing learning. If you ask anyone you know the question, how do you learn to do that? You know, remember anything that you're particularly good at and someone asks you, how do you do that? What would you say? Would you say something like, I practice it, or I watch somebody else do it, or being told how to do it? Wondering about our own and others' behavior is one of the main topics of human of humans that you're that we are interested in. You know, we want to know why did you behave like that? Or what makes someone behave differently from me? Or how can I learn to behave like that? When my daughter was about three or four years old, she learned how to scramble and cook an egg in the microwave by watching me. She served me a scrambled egg and a shell one morning in bed. She then practiced cooking an egg and she never she was never told how to cook an egg but it appeared that she observed me doing it sufficiently to learn the behavior. Now we may need to practice and refine the skills we acquire as in my case of uh, and my daughter who didn't remove the shell from a scrambled egg to, for me. Uh, there is no doubt that watching and observing others engage and perform in different behaviors significantly influence our own behavior. Furthermore, understanding the key principles of why and how we learn can provide insightful recognition of the behavior of others and ourselves. So by definition, learning is defined as a relatively permanent change in our behavior, knowledge, capability, attitude acquired through practice and experience. Learning cannot be attributed to illness, injury, or maturation, just normal developmental stages as we grow up. For example, infants do not learn to walk. Instead, it's a basic motor skill and maturation or just getting older governs our species that way. So learning is an important topic in psychology and has been a long history in researching how we learn. So we're going to begin our review with one of the most simple and powerful forms of learning, classical conditioning. Learning by association, it's known as. Classical conditioning is a simple form of associative learning that enables organisms to anticipate events. Now the founder, Ivan Pavlov, who was a biologist, came up with classical conditioning. He was studying the salivation of dogs and accidentally discovered classical conditioning. Reflexes, the simple automatic responses to stimuli that are unlearned. Now the stimulus, it's the environmental condition that brings about or evokes a response from an organism. We are organisms, dogs are organisms. Um, Okay, so a stimulus is any event or object in the environment that we directly or indirectly interact with. Okay, so Pavlov's experiments demonstrated some of the principles of classical conditioning. During classical conditioning, a neutral stimulus, that's the tone that he provided or the bell for the dogs to hear, that's neutral. It didn't mean one thing or another, it's just a bell. And it's presented shortly before an unconditioned stimulus. Unconditioned stimulus being the food, you didn't have to condition a dog to want to eat, they come with that already built in, which it naturally elicits or brings forth an unconditioned response, which would be salivation at the sight of the food. So what he's doing here, he's starting to pair the sound with the showing of the food, and that's the association, that when the association is made, he should be able to salivate at the sound of the bell. After repeated pairings, the conditioned stimulus, the tone, because that wasn't, there was no reason for the tone to mean anything to the dog, but it got conditioned, associated, by, it, by itself will elicit the conditioned response, the salivation. So over time, that's what will start to happen. And that's what he found out. So why did Pavlov's dogs learn to salivate in response to a tone? Organisms form the association between stimuli because the stimuli are contiguous. That is, they occur at the same time. 
They also learn because the stimuli is paired repeatedly. Now, cognitive psychologists view classical conditioning as learning of relationships among events. The focus is on the information gained by the organism, which is not how the behaviors see it. Stimulus leads to a response. Stimulus response in classical conditioning. Now, this is sort of the inner workings of what classical conditioning is. We're going to use some terms and I'll revisit them. The unconditioned stimulus, the UCS, is unlearned. Pavlov's meat powder elicit the salivation, which was unconditioned response from the dogs. Now, there's such a thing as what's known as orientating reflex. And in this case, the automatic response of the dogs to look at in the direction of the sound, it was a new and novel stimulus. Remember, that's one of the things that we respond to in consciousness is new sounds or new stimuli, novel stimuli. So when the dogs learned to salivate to the sound of the bell, previously that bell was neutral, the bell became the conditioned stimulus. And the salivation in response to the bell is known as the conditioned response. Okay? Now, to extend on this, um, Watson and Rayner, they experimented with what is been known as Little Albert Classical Conditioning of Fear. And they published an article stating that emotional reactions such as fear can be either conditioned, be a conditioned response, or an unconditioned response. So 11-month-old Little Albert was conditioned to fear rats due to the clanging of steel bars behind his head while he played with a rat. Now, Little Albert was conditioned to uh, fear not only a white rat, but generalized to include other white fuzzy animals, like rabbits and cats. The condition to be afraid of white rats and other white objects, Little Albert was removed by his mother from the experiment, you can understand, before Watson and Rader could counter-condition or reverse the learning. Now, counter-conditioning is a fear reduction technique wherein pleasant stimuli are associated with the fear evoking stimuli so that the fear evoking stimuli loses aversive conditions or quality. So in the case of um, Watson and Jones, they're counting conditioning of Peter, another um, subordinate or person who was tested, I guess, Peter. He was a two-year-old with an extreme fear of rabbits. Jones, who's one of the um, researchers came up with what was known as systematic desensitization. It's a behavior fear reduction technique wherein a hierarchy of fear evoking stimuli are presented. When the person remains relaxed, it's presented. So if I'm relaxed and I have a fear of white rats, then you start with something more benign and we work our way up to handling a rat. And that would be um, what Jones was trying to get at. Now, there's two other terms that we could use here under classical condi conditioning, and that would be extinction and spontaneous recovery. Now, extinction is the process by which a conditioned stimuli loses the ability to elicit the conditioned response because the conditioned stimuli is no longer paired with the unconditioned stimuli. And so some things that are learned can be lost if that connection is lost, if that association is lost. Now, spontaneous recovery, this is where a recovery of a conditioned response after it's been extinct. A function of the passage of time, a response is still there, it's just waiting for the right time. So spontaneous recovery, like extinction, is adaptive. A couple of other terms in classical that you may have heard but not applied in this way, and that is generalization and discrimination. Generalization is the tendency for a conditioned response to be evoked by the stimuli similar to the stimulus to which the response was conditioned. For example, you've learned to make your bed, and you've learned about even blanket distribution, placing the pillow in the correct location of the bed, sheets and blankets in the correct order, but you can generalize that ability to generalize would be to adapt it and apply it um, 
into, say, your bed making to putting a tablecloth on a table. You use some similar skill sets, but you've generalized it to something that's not a bed making. It's now table making. Discrimination, unlike the term that we might use when looking at um, race, and we might use the term discrimination, here in classical conditioning, discrimination is, is, is defined differently. Organisms must learn that many stimuli perceived as being similar can in fact still be functionally different. This term is essential when we talk about multiple choice questions on tests, for example. You need to discriminate or see the differences between the four possible correct answers, A, B, C, or D. One is correct. Your preparation will help you discriminate the correct answer from the incorrect answers. Organisms must respond adaptively to each. Now, if we can think about higher order conditioning, the previous neutral stimuli comes to serve as a learned or con um, conditioned stimuli after being paired repeatedly with a stimulus that's already become learned. Pavlov achieved this by getting the dogs to salivate to the shining of a light which was paired with the tone. Now you might want to check in your textbook for some of the applications of classical conditioning. We're going to move now into the second type in our learning, and that is operant conditioning learning. Now the main thrust of uh, operant conditioning is reinforcement and punishment. Now it's important to note operants, operant conditioning, operants are behaviors. So it's essentially behavior conditioning. B.F. Skinner was the um, author of much of the work done in this area. He has a lot of historical contributions and it began with believing that pigeons could be trained to guide missiles to their targets. The project for the military ended up being scrapped and the pigeon equipment was too bulky. However, he did initiate and start what ended up being a Skinner box from this work. Okay, concepts of reinforcement. Organisms learn to do something because of the effect or consequence of the behavior. Operant behavior is behavior that operates on or manipulates the environment. Operant conditioning is a simple form of learning in which the organism learns to engage in certain behaviors because of the effect of the behavior. Now there are different methods of operant conditioning and we're going to focus on what people, organisms, do. Skinner devised an operant chamber or a Skinner box and it was a cage for animals used to study operant conditioning. The chambers had a lever that the animals could press to obtain reinforcement, little food chunks, and turning a drum or cumulative recorder to measure behavior. And to press a lever, you get food. It matters little how the first response that is reinforced is made. It could be a random or guided, people could be verbally guided into the desired response. So what was important about it is that as soon as they did something that related to the depressing of the lever, they got a reinforcement and every close approximation got more reinforcement. And we'll come back to that because we'll label it as uh, shaping. So let's look at the types of reinforcers. Any stimulus that increases the probability that a response will be, um, will be result is repeated. That, let me just repeat that. A positive reinforcement is anything that increases the likelihood that a behavior is going to be repeated. But there are two kinds of reinforcers, positive and negative reinforcers. Positive, any pleasant or desirable consequence that follows a, follows a response and increases the probability that the response will be repeated. They are roughly the same as a reward. If you smile as you walk down the street, some people smile back at you and say nice things. You, you, you want to smile at everyone as you were, as you were rewarded, rein, uh, rewarded, reinforced, and therefore increased the likelihood that you'll do it again. Now, negative reinforcers, now this is often misunderstood. Negative reinforcers or negative reinforcement is not punishment. Uh, it does not mean... Um, 
Punishment, negative reinforcement means the termination of unpleasant condition after response. This is key. It increases the probability that the response will be repeated. So that's really important. Turning on air conditioning when to avoid the heat is negative reinforcement. Getting out of bed to turn off a leaky faucet is negative reinforcement. Heron addicts will do almost anything to get another fix and avoid the pain of withdrawal. Negative reinforcement. Immediate versus delayed reinforcers. Let's consider that. Does it make a difference? Immediate reinforcers are more effective than delayed reinforcers. And that comes back time and time again as legitimate. The wait till your dad gets home type of feature of punishment or negative reinforcement um, alternatives don't show to be very effective because it's not immediate. It's delayed and it's not as effective. Short-term consequences um, often provide better incentives than long-term consequences. Now there's two types of reinforcers. Aside from being positive and negative, what you call primary or secondary reinforcers. Primary reinforcers are effective because the organism biologically needs it. Food, water. Those are two primary reinforcers. Your body needs it. Secondary reinforcers, these are, require, these are acquired um, through learning. Uh, we learn what social things are rewarding. For example, um, a secondary reinforcer would be our paycheck. It's not food and it's not water. It might be important. However, we learn the value of a paycheck and we work for two weeks before we see a paycheck. And so it still acts as a reinforcer. And in this instance, we learn that the delay is acceptable and that it still produces the outcomes that we want. Now, punishment. This is one we need to look at because it's often misunderstood as well. Negative reinforcement is not punishment. Reinforcers are known by their effect. If the frequency of the behavior increases, then the behavior is rewarded. Rewards and punishment are known, but not how they feel, by not how they feel, but by the fact that they follow an increase or decrease. Now, punishments are adversive events that suppress, the, that suppress or decrease the frequency of the behavior that they follow. They can be they can rapidly suppress the frequency of the behavior that they follow. If you're going to use punishment, there are strategies to use for it to be most effective. The most effective when they are applied at the time or immediately after the problem behavior. The best approach is the least punitive to affect change. And it's really important that they are applied consistently and that anger is not involved. Now, two terms that we could use in operant, extinction and spontaneous recovery. Extinction is the weakening and disappearance of a conditioned response as a result of withholding reinforcements, whereas spontaneous recovery occurs when the reward returns and the behavior increases. Now, I've mentioned about discriminative stimuli, and it acts as a cue by providing information about the behavior and when it will be reinforced. Behaviors that are not reinforced will be extinction, will be extinguished. Behaviors that are engaged in after a discriminative stimulus will be reinforced and continued. Now, I've mentioned a fair bit about reinforcement, but one of the key things about the delivery of reinforcement are schedules, like when to reinforce, under what circumstances. So when we look at schedules of reinforcement, some responses are maintained by means of continuous reinforcement, that is reinforcement after every response, and some new behaviors are acquired more rapidly through continuous reinforcement. Whereas partial reinforcement can also maintain behavior, reinforcing behavior part of the time. Behavior is more resistant to exist extinction when partial reinforcement is used. Now there's two kinds. There's interval, um, interval schedules 
and we'll look at that. Now, when you think of interval schedules, think in terms of time. A fixed interval is a fixed amount of time must elapse between the previous and subsequent times when reinforcement occurs. In other words, reinforce first appropriate response after a fixed amount of time has elapsed. The variable interval, it's still an interval, therefore it's still about time, reinforces the first appropriate response after a vari variable amount of time has elapsed. So in terms of that, you might say, I will re reinforce the, the chosen behavior, the desired behavior, in this five minute window. I will do it once. And then if it's done in the first minute, then you don't reinforce any more examples of the behavior in that five minute period. Then there's a second period of five minutes. And if that behavior occurs in that five minutes, then I reinforce that. That is a fixed interval. And then, of course, the variable interval is just variable amounts of time, not five minutes. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's five, sometimes it's ten. Then we get into ratio schedules. Ratio schedules are about numbers, not the time, but how many times the behavior occurs. So fixed ratio, the reinforcement is provided after a fixed number of correct response have made. So if I do a, um, um, a fixed ratio of five, every five times I see the behavior that's been, that we want to reinforce, I reinforce it only after five times. The variable ratio, the reinforcement is provided after a variable number of correct responses. And you see the diagram beside me to give you some example. Both ratio schedules, both ratio schedules maintain high rates of responding. Now I alluded this earlier, but I'm going to emphasize a bit of it now, and that is the term shaping. Operant conditioning involves the technique of shaping, and it consists of gradually molding desired behavior or responses by reinforcing any movement in the direction of the desired response. Gradually, responses are guided toward the ultimate goal. With the use of su successive approximations or a series of gradual steps, each of which is more similar to the final and desired response. So parents will shape children's uh, behavior by praising them each time that they show improvement. Circus animals have learned f all sorts of different feats using shaping. Pigeons learn how to bowl and play piano. So there's all sorts of different variables. So you can look in your textbook for other applications of, uh, of operant conditioning. Um, some of the examples include behavior modification. It's probably a term you've heard, but it's really misunderstood on how to apply it. Behavior modification is, the, is in the classroom accentuating the positive, and they use token economy. It's often, this is very much misunderstood, in that it's often not put together completely and thoroughly to make the most effective use of what a token economy system is. Um, it results in the conditioning of undesirable behaviors. This, of course, needs to change. We have to be careful that one of the risks with token economy, when they're not done very well, is that they can reinforce the behavior you don't want to see inadvertently. So um, another use of operant conditioning, again, it's another misunderstood technique, is timing out or time out. These techniques involve more steps and conditions for sex for success than most people are aware. Now the third group we'll look at are the cognitive factors in learning. The cognitive uh, psychologists use concepts such as mental structures, schemas, templates, and information processing. Now latent learning is a, a forming in terms of our forming of uh, cognitive maps, Tolman showed that rats learn about their environment in the absence of any reinforcement. This knowledge can be used later. So learning might remain hidden or latent until it is motivated to behave. So although I don't know 
you know, you know, everything about um, a particular room, the fact that I have mapped it out and have an idea about it means that I can come back and use it when I need it. And then it becomes reinforcing. So let's look at contingency theory. Contingency theory suggests that learning occurs only when the conditioned stimulus provides information about the unconditioned stimulus. Um, Riscorla um, concluded that co-appearance of two events cannot in itself explain classical conditioning. Instead, learning occurs only when the conditioned stimulus providers uh, provides information about the unconditioned stimulus. So learning theory occurs because a conditioned stimulus indicates that an unconditioned stimulus is likely to follow. Now one way that a lot of the cognitive group, social cognitive group, look at learning is what's known as observational learning. Albert Bandura proposed that we acquire operants behaviors by observing the behavior of others rather than actually experiencing the event. Some of this learning can be exhibited immediately where others learn, um, others learning may be dormant. A person who engages in a response to be imitated is what's known as a model. Now it's really important. Observers are said to be vicariously reinforced. Now I want to go back to the models. We are all models to someone. As a parent or a sibling, you're a model to your children or your siblings. If you teach, coach, or in some way interact with children, you are more than likely a model to somebody. Children do not, don't just come up to you and say, oh, by the way, I want you to know you're my model. This is a seamless and often very unknown as to who you are a model for. And so it's important that we behave in the way that if someone's modeling us, we would want them to be modeling us with, and no one has. Therefore, around, therefore, around others, you never know when you are a model. Bandura did some additional work in the area of modeling violence and aggression, and media influences and statistics. Both children and teens spend up to about 44 hours per week engaged in various media social media, video games, online games. Now, but Bandura's effect of violence on media, he started to look at what are some of the other variables that play a role. Learning by observing the behavior of others and the consequences of that behavior. It often involves imitation, and Bandura's famous a Bobo doll experiment demonstrated that young children will imitate the aggressive actions of a model even when there is no reinforcement for doing it. Violence is often portrayed in media as having only a temporary or minimal effect, if any. This has been a quick uh, and complete <laughs> overview of learning. Um, it's a very big topic and it's very difficult to try to simplify it down into something very basic. However, that's what this textbook is trying to do. So I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, so that's the end of this chapter. States of consciousness. No. That's the end of this chapter on learning. It's a big chapter and we did it all in one week. So I hope this has worked out well for you. Good luck everybody and we'll see you next week. Bye now.